Hi everyone, my name is Yashwan Samutasami. I have my own consulting firm, Yashwan Solutions, and I and I consult in areas such as conversational AI bots, generative AI, AR, VR, IoT, and IP analysis. I'm not a lawyer by training, but I kind of bridge the bridge the vocabularies between the technical field and the, and the legal. That's me. It's good to be here. Okay, let's go to the talk. This is going to be the, the, the outline of my talk. I'm going to give an introduction to what generative AI is, spend a little bit of time on large language models, which I assume is what most of us have used. Who all use chat GPT on a daily basis? Um, daily. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. Oh, and then I'll be talking about tools that IoT practitioners can use, which actually are meant for a lot of people can use them. But if you are trying to build something, you might find it specifically useful. And then talk about the various areas with which generative AI and IoT can interact with each other. Uh, and then end with a few thoughts on functionality versus responsibility and what it all means for human creativity. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's start right at the beginning, as they say. Uh, what, what are the different types of AI? You might have seen these acronyms thrown about. Uh, ANI or artificial and, 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 and narrow intelligence is actually what we all have come to take for granted. That is speech recognition, facial recognition, so, 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 so something which is now quite ubiquitous in pretty much every part of the world. And that's ANI. AGI is what, depending on whom you talk to, the claim is that we are already there or what we are about to be there. I kind of have a slightly different view there. And ASI is something I hope we never reach, at least based on how that graphic looks. It's kind of a dy dystopian view of the f f f future that's Skynet and beyond, really. Uh, and in my opinion, we are kind of there. We are just beginning to scratch the surface, or maybe we will. Uh, but uh, we can talk more about that. So that's the overall landscape. But what is Gen AI? It is a it's a type of AI that can create new content, and it's not just text, but it can be e e images, music, video, and and even code. That, that that that's what generative AI really is overall. And so the model is first trained on a large data set. And when I say large, I cannot emphasize that word enough of existing data. This data could be anything from uh, text to images to music. The model then learns to identify the patterns and relationships. And once it's trained, then it can be used to generate new data that is similar to what was trained on. Yeah. No, or oh. even if Martin. Oh, OK. <laughs> Sorry. OK, what are the various applications? Well, we, we all have seen this. If you open up your social media feed, LinkedIn, you're probably going to see a lot of realistic looking e e e images and videos that have been be generated. And the actual uh, models or the type of networks that, that, that create them are called generative adversarial networks or diffusion model, models. And I'm going to spend just a minute or two explaining this because it's kind of interesting. Generator at adversarial networks are actually two neural networks which are competing with each other. There is a there is a generative network and there is a discriminative net, net, net network. The job of the generative network is to create new data, fake data based on the data that is being trained on. The job of the discriminator network is to is to find out that it's fake. And they go back and forth, giving feedback to each other. And the training is done when the generator network becomes so good that the discriminator network is actually fooled to thinking that it has gotten the real. So that's what a GAN is. And that's what is used to generate these images. Diffusion models, they start with a random noise image. And they're constantly, they're constantly refined. In incrementally to get until it reaches a level of level of realism that is considered okay and then you stop training so th those are the two different ways in which you can 
generate new, 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 new images. Of course, we all are familiar with the generator pre-trained tra transformers, which is what are used to generate large, uh, which is of what we all use when we use Ch chat GPT or, or BARD. And then you have, you also have GANs and variational auto encoders, which are, which can be used to generate music. As far as music is concerned, VAEs are considered to be more creative, that the chances of getting better content are higher with VAEs than, than, than GANs. And then code, of course. Who uses GPT to do their code? There you go. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. it out on some small software. Yeah. Just make sure you check it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it is a language model, not a math model, right? Right. right. Yes. Right. Although GPT-4 is doing better than GPT-3.5. So these are the various things. Unfortunately, this is a Venn diagram. I don't know how, how much of it you are able to see. I think you can see better by the, by the light is much less. But I, I wanted to touch briefly on this because this is a really cool new technology and it accentuates uh, the value of contextual data. So here you have the large language model. That, 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 that's one circle. Then you have the user input or user intent. And the third circle is the external contextual reference data. So if you had just a large language model and then you have the user input, that's when you get the problem of model hallucination, where the model pretty much goes off the deep end and generates an output which looks plausible, but it's complete crap. It is complete nonsense and it's not factual, but that's what it's called model hallucination. And it's doing that because if even though you ask it to do something, it doesn't have the underlying uh, baseline or a frame of, of, of reference. Now, if you, did, if you didn't have any user input and you, all you had is external reference data and the large language model, then what you end up with at the intersection is a fine-tuned large language model, a large language model that is now, now grounded with, 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 with context. Now, if you, if you didn't have a large language model and all you had is user input and external data, then you have your regular regular chatbot, but you're, which means you're still, you're, you're still responsible for the natural language generation, you're responsible for the developer for the dialogue management, and you're responsible to have the, the, the backbone and the, and the breadth of knowledge that a large language model brings. But when you put all of these two together, that's when you have a rack, a, a retrieval augmented generation model. And what this is, is this is a model that combines information retrieval and generator models to give you contextually, contextually relevant and more accurate output. So let me give you a really simplistic example. If I asked Chad GPT what happened in 1914, it's most likely going to come back with a whole bunch of things which happened in 1914. I may not be interested in all of them, but I'm interested in only one event. So if I gave it an additional context saying that the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and ask the same question, then it comes back with what I'm after, which is that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Gavrilo Princip, and that was the trigger to World War One, which happened in 1914. So a RAG is using the contextual information which I provide, in addition to my query, and now it's able to focus on what it is that it's, it is meant to output. This example is kind of simplistic, but it kind of illustrates the point, which is you need to provide, if you if you provide the, the, the external data, the, 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 the contextual data, then it's able to do what you want it to do. So that, that, that's what RAGs are used for. And you, you will hear RAGs being mentioned a lot these days. At least they are on my LinkedIn feed. OK, let's jump into large language models a bit and chat GPT. We all have heard about o o o open AI. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, 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 that mission. Uh, well, 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 the, main, the main focus is to create large language models to generate text that seems like it's, it's, it's written by humans. Uh, GPT, as I mentioned already, is 
generative pre trained transformers. But what is a G G GPT? It is a transformer model, which is just another type of a foundation model. So now I've thrown out a bunch of uh, buzzwords here. Let's look more into more detail. What is the foundation model? It is just a deep neural network which has been trained on large quantities of unlabeled data. And it, this data could be anything. It could be text. It could, Don't worry about it. Okay. Go on. Um, so it could be text on in, in images of speech or 3D signals. And then the model gets trained on that. And then uh, it can be adapted to a whole bunch of different use cases. So we have these question answering, sentiment analysis, image capturing, so on and so forth. And this is what is uh, uh, allowing us new applications in natural language processing and so on. What is it? What is it? Transformer model. It is just a type of foundation model. Yes. And it was it and uh, transformer models were first built by a seminal paper by by, by, by a bunch of researchers uh, the researchers at Google in 2017. And they showed that it can be used to process sequential data such as natural language text. And it is based on this concept of multi headed extension, which I will explain in a, in, in, in a moment. And then it allows the model to weigh the importance of different parts of the input sequence that it is given. The transformer architecture is at the heart of all large language models. Now, this is a great source to go learn more about the, the, the transformer model, but I'm going to give you a quick high level explanation and, the, and, and you will know it in a minute why I'm spending so, so much time on this. Okay, so at the half, at the first step, so if you have an input sentence like write a story, the first step is the words that that, that sentence is broken down into what are called tokens. So in this particular sentence, you have four tokens. You have three words, and you have the you have the period at the end. So all punctuation marks are also tokens. Then what happens in the end of the setting case? The tokens get converted to vectors of numbers. Humans are, are understand words. Machines understand numbers. The, the vectors of, of, of numbers are a lot better. But then you want to order the numbers in each vector, and that, that's what position encoding does. And why do you need to do that? So look at this sentence. I'm not happy. I'm sad. I'm not sad. I'm happy. They both have the same number of words, but the meaning of the sentence is completely different because the words are in a different order. And so you need to reflect that word order. And so a vector that represents the first sentence cannot be the same as a vector that represents the second sentence, even though they have the same words. So, and that's what positional encoding really does. It actually adds a predefined vector to ensure that you are able to capture this difference. And then you go into a series of these transformer blocks. Yeah. When you said order numbering there, yeah. So on the second step is where the numbering is done. The, the and embedding is where then uh, yeah the numbering is done and yes. knows what those sequences right yes and these vectors by, by, by the way can be really large I mean they they they, they can be about I mean they can range from four thousand and ninety six like four k to all the way to sixteen k and that's why you need so much of horsepower to 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 train these things okay and then these these Blocks are what are the what are called the transformer blocks, and what are these? This is just adding context to the words, and and you can have as many blocks as you need. And why do you need to have these different contexts? Look at this example: money in the bank versus the bank of the river. It's the same word, but based on the context in which it occurs, it's going to have a completely different meaning. And I've just given you two examples that the word, word, the meaning of the word is different, but they could be a, a, a number of different meanings of, of other words. So you could have any number of blocks. The more number of blocks you have, the better the word context is going to be, and the more accurate your model is going to be. But then it also means 
that we're going to have a lot more horsepower to train it because each one of these blocks is a feed forward deep neural network. So we are talking about a lot of nodes here. If you are talking about a lot of hyperparameters and you're talking about serious horsepower. And then what, what does the feed forward mo mo module do? All it does is it predicts the next word in the sequence and it gives it a score. And so once you've gone through these series of blocks, you are then the, the last mo mo module, it takes these word scores and converts them to a probability between zero and one. And then you pick the most probable word in the sequence and that happens to be once because it, because you asked it to say, write a story. So it came back with once is the first word then once upon a time, right? So it's gonna, so it's gonna do this for every single word that it generates. So that's what's happening in chat GPT. And, but it's able to do it so fast because it's been trained and it's also using a lot of horsepower to actually do, do this. And so that's the bottom line. So if you said write a story about the bank. Then it's, it's gonna do this for each of the, is it going to give you multiple answers? No, I mean, it, 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 it's, going to, it's going to give you an uh, uh, answer, which it's going to be what it thinks it is the, is the uh, output it needs to be. Because if you ever asked it to do a, do a regeneration of an answer, you'll get a slightly di different answer. It's because it, it, it goes and, <laughs> and picks the ne next probable word in the sequence and it slightly changes the answer. So if I gave it, write a story about the bank, it might give me the financial institution and then- It could. And if you ask it to- I would say, I'm, to, I'm talking about yeah. the bank of the river or something as a follow-up. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I will touch briefly upon the, 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 the value of providing as much guidance to a large language model, because that is the only way it's going to give you the output which you need. If you give it a really short prompt, you, you then cannot turn around and say that, oh, it didn't work for me. But that's because it's like it's like the same kind of thing. If you have an employee and you didn't give proper instruction to the employee on what you wanted him or her to do, then you don't have the right to then say, oh, this employee didn't do what, what I wanted. Well, because you didn't tell him or her what you wanted done. Same principle here. Any two details in a prompt? But can get too detailed? There, there is there is nothing stopping you from giving as much detail. I mean, one thing that you will re re read, of course, they give it the fancy name prompt engineering, but all it is is giving it the requisite amount of detail of detail for it to give you the proper output. So, for example, if I wanted to write a business letter, I can say that write a business letter to so and so asking them for x y and z but use a you have the option of saying use a fun and casual tone which would be kind of strange for a business letter or use a very professional and serious tone and the output that you get in both those cases is going to be quite different so don't hesitate to provide as much of input as possible for it to give you the right answer. Did that, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So about three months ago, Walker Reynolds talked to this group about um, AI and IoT and the whole bit. And he made a comment, and I'm wondering if you can maybe expand on it sure. per se. But he made the comment that those who have uh, I guess in touch with emotion, tend to be able to create prompts that produce better content from AI because of the emotional connection, which absolutely makes no sense to me because this is all logic, ones and zeros. Do you have any clue why that is the case? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I have an entire s s slide on that. Chat okay. GPT right. doesn't know you from Adam yeah. or, or Eve, okay? All it's doing is this. It, it, that, that's the reason I spend so much time in this slide. It is just finding the next probable word in the sequence. The reason he said what he said, I mean, I wasn't there for the talk. Uh, 
is because all he's saying is the point that I was made, 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 making, making about two minutes ago, which is that the more information you provide about what you want, the better it's able to give you the output, which is more in line with what you had in mind. Okay. So if you give it inputs where you say, where you say, I want it in a fun and casual tone, or I want this letter to read in a more empathetic tone, that it's going to give you that. Okay. So yeah. Walker's point was that he was trying to say the people that had higher emotional intelligence, i.e. the ones that could empathize more, mm -hmm could place themselves in a point of view perspective to get a more detailed answer was what I think he was trying to say. And yeah, yeah. and I bet this person who was more empathetic didn't give a prompt that had like five words. They probably gave it a really long time. Yes. Prompt. Okay. So, so effectively, so uh, well, coming back to that, what you brought up here, <laughs> if it's a voice input, and if it's able to pick up the emotions from that, that stand for a different story. That is a, that is a completely di different story. We are not quite there yet. Yeah. They're actually, I've worked with a company that actually does this, yeah. that picks up inflection and emotion and has an AI model that says happy, sad, frustrated, etc. They had like a long list of vocal characteristics that they had modeled. You can. Oh. And so it's pretty, it's pretty neat. It's, yeah. it's proprietary and, and, uh, copyrighted, but they do have an AI model that does emotional yeah, yeah. inflection. A, a great big probability database, right? And I've got all the, the things. I could. I, I love the example that you said, give a quite a casual and fun business letter. But I can also ask it to write an angry business letter. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but oh, that's emotional. Yes, yeah, exactly. So I, and, and I've had to do that in the past. I have, well, it is, this is where the nuances come into play. I had to do, I had a company under contract with Litton, uh, Canoga out, Canoga Hills. They were handpicked by me, but they weren't performing. So my management said, you have to issue a stop work letter to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm mad at my management. I'm mad at them. I'm <laughs> mad at myself. I would have liked to have been able to say to AI, write an angry letter. But I don't want to, this would, it, it, I don't. I wouldn't want to close the door on ever doing business with them again. Yeah. So I'd have to have, say, write an angry yet understanding way. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But then I'm thinking, well, but they do need to be reprimanded. <laughs> so, so I think what I'm getting uh, to your comment is that you can qualify these things, Absolutely. and that simply narrows your focus in the probability database. And you you may get lucky, you may hit it, you may not. Uh, but it's just, it's fascinating to me how this probability database continues to expand and allows us a little more flexibility. And so I was hoping you might touch on maybe the current state of language models uh, and and things like that that guide me better in the future when I'm using AI to sure. do a stop work. I, I, I have one slide that kind of touches on that, okay. but, but after we are done, the you can let me know if I've answered your question. Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. Anyway, so the large language models are just a type of transformer models, which in turn are a type of foundation models. That's the takeaway from here. Okay, we all know, we all have seen some or more of these for biological sequence analysis, text generation, translation, sentiment analysis, abstract summarization, code generation. These are the major players in the, I, I don't know has anybody used all three of them i don't use claude and i didn't know claude and claude is actually uh, and if you see the training cutoff date makes a huge difference because if you ask i mean i've asked chat gpt a number of questions and it just throws its hand up or it gives me blatantly wrong answers because yeah. of the trade of the, of the date that it was last trained on, or the, the date on which the, the, the training was or what was taught. Claude is meant to be really good for uh, factual tasks, but I do uh, agree with this. It is great. Chat GPT is great for creative text generation, which is kind of like the output of the pro of the prompts. Yeah. So I've got a question yeah. online from. Yeah. From uh, hey Richard, go ahead and ask your question. Well, well, I was. Well, you asked me. You asked me. All three. 
what I'm here for. So, and and also Claude has got low bias. You can't say the same thing about Chat GPT. I mean, if you want to rank these three in terms of the amount of bias that they have, if this is the least biased, Bard is a slightly more so, and Chat GPT is the worst. And the reason for that that that, that is it is the old beggars can't be choosers mentality. When Chat GPT was being trained, they, any data was good data from all kinds of websites, <laughs> even from the dark web. It, it, everything went. It, it, everything was fair game. So it's basically whatever you put, put in is what you're going to get, get out of it. It's very easy to have chat GPT go off the rails and provide output, which can be quite unsavory. So just, just keep that in mind. <laughs> but the big advantage of chat GPT is they actually have APIs. Google and Claude haven't yet provided that functionality. So the, the, the GPT-4 and the GPT-3.5 APIs, you can actually play around quite a bit. OK, these are some tools which may or may not be of value to you guys, but I, but I, but I usually use them in my intro to this. Uh, OpenAI, uh, who, who has used OpenAI APIs? Uh, and uh, they, 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 these are for different tasks, and it's not free. You have to they get a paid subscription if you want to use the APIs. DALI 2 is a ticket. It comes with a very limited number of free credits. Uh, Hugging Face is by far the best resource if you want to go and look at different large language models and you want to play around. You have a good online forum and you can get access to pretty much any large language model. Not all of them are free. For example, for the Llama 2 models, you have to go to Meta's website first and get, get authorized and then come back to this website to get access to the model. Uh, Platypus is a comparatively new player, but they provide quick, cheap, and powerful refinement of large language models. And this is one of the smallest models that I've seen, 13 billion hyperparameters. That's small because Llama and Falcon just re released 180 billion. Farm 2 is 570 billion from Google. From Google. So this is a really small model, but see how long it takes to train. You, you can you, you can use a single A hundred GPU, but it takes about five hours on twenty five thousand questions. Uh, Perplexity AI recently closed the funding round of about twenty three million, million. They are best described as an AI research assistant. It is like Google search with all the large language models kind of built in. Yes, do we know what kind of compute power is being used by chat Thanks of G GPUs. Are they like GPUs? A, yes, they, they have to be G GPUs. <laughs> there is no way around it. The game changer there is going to be quantum computers, because they are they are at least two or three orders of, of magnitude much so faster. So they're using NVIDIA for that? Wow. I, I, I don't know the exact model models, but they are all, they're using banks of, of GPUs. Just to give a context, their uh, daily billing is uh, north of 800,000. Sorry, what's that again? Their daily billing, just for the GPU, is north of 800,000. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, if you haven't tried per perplexity, it's it's worth a shot. They're really good. And well, 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 once you, you use them, you begin to understand why all the big players have jumped to basically to give them that amount of money. Yeah, it actually will engage in a back and forth dialogue with you before it answers your, your, your question. Okay, Langchain. Uh, anybody here use Langchain? Yeah, it's a framework that helps de developers build applications using large language models, a bunch of tools and libraries. And the best part of it is it's large language model invariant, which means you can plug in different models because it provides the same abstract API classes. It does have language model specific APIs, but for the most part, 
this is very useful. I actually built a quick and dirty language translation app using this, and I was able to, to plug in the, the, the different models to see which one did, 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 did the best for language translation. So now LangSmith goes hand in hand with, 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 with LangChain. You do not have to use LangSmith with LangChain, or you can use LangSmith by itself and, and not use that LangChain, but if you use both, it will make your life infinitely more easier because it it, it, it provides the debug, test, and evaluate capability of applications that you create using LangChain. So it's good to use it to take a look at that. This is a comparatively new new, new player, and they claim that they, they allow business to, to create their own, own custom chatbots with their data. It's a no-code platform, so you could go in there and you can presumably stand up your chat, chat, chatbot really fast. Uh, the online the online reviews are worth reading. Uh, so via uh, Viver, this is the key phrase which gave me some pause. They say that mm -hmm. it's powered by Chat GPT four. What that means is your data is going to OpenAI servers. Your data is going to be looked at by OpenAI engineers. You might be completely okay with that if you are a small enough business or you work in an area where you know keeping your business data from third party eyes is is not a big deal for you. But if you are working with the, the business data that you don't want anybody else taking a look at, then I would read the terms of service a bit, bit more, more closely. Uh, okay, now we move into an area which might be of more interest to this group. What are the different ways in which generative AI and I I IoT can play nicely with each other? We all know about relative maintenance in, in, in IoT, the devices that monitor missionary for vibrations and temperature and, and, and whatnot. But where does GenAI come in? Uh, it will analyze the data and predict a potential breakdown, but that's you can do with, with vanilla machine learning too. But where GenAI gives you value, it can then use all of this data and then generate a maintenance schedule that, uh, that will make sure that you don't have those kinds of, 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 of breakdowns. And in uh, as I go down this list, you will see names of, 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 of companies. And these are companies that are actually using this as we speak. And if you see an a a asterisk next to the, to the company name, it means they are they have plans of actually making use of, of generate. Smart homes and building automation, we all know what the I IoT play there is. But where does GenAI it, it is able to learn the patterns and the preferences of the occupants and then generate lighting and HVAC schedules to maintain the opti optimal conditions. Uh, agricultural optimization. I I IoT sensors can monitor soil conditions, weather patterns, crop health, and the whole nine yards. Where does GenAI enter? You can, I mean, it, it can create predictive models, and then you can have it could have it to generate optimized planning and mitigation schedules. And if you notice, there is a common theme here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is a common theme. There is, a, there is not just the machine learning aspect, which we are all used to in regular AI, but the fact that it is taking advantage of the generative capabilities of the model to give you some output. That that is huge, especially if you're a farmer and you want to know yep. where to bid your crop at at the Chicago board. Right. Having that crop yield in your yes. pocket, in your back pocket, is just invaluable. Yes. Yeah. Personalized health healthcare. You actually have a few a few companies. But by the way, full 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 full, 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 full disclaimer. This list is not a exhaustive list. I've just picked some. Representative, so it's very likely that you will find a bunch of other companies who are actually. So we, we all know the usual 
IoT play, you have wearable devices, they can monitor vital signs and activity levels, but where Gen AI provides value, you have personalized healthcare plans and, uh, uh, and including the diet recommendations and exercise schedules. My wife is a registered dietitian and she was quite impressed with the output that chat GPT-4 did when she asked it to provide a diet plan and she gave input on on what the patient was yeah are, are there any devices that you're aware of that monitor say blood sugar in the case of a diabetic uh, oh yeah well, yeah. Schedule, that sort of thing. yeah i mean they have what are called i mean uh, the, i think libre yeah, I, uh, what, what i forget the full, full name but it's actually a, 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 a device that you have on your arm and that is providing constant more monitoring of your blood sugar level and it actually talks via bluetooth le with, with, with the app wow made by abbott yeah okay uh so yeah so this this, this actually works uh and then of course intelligent traffic ma management we all know the usual iot play but where gen ai adds value it can actually come up with a traffic management plan. It can say that we, we are able to op, op, optimize that traffic lighting. If you are a user of the road, it can give you optimal driving routes. I mean, which is kind of like what Google Maps does right now. Content plus <laughs> smart devices. <laughs> you have the smart home devices that know what what movies you watch, what songs you listen to, and uh, and it can learn your preferences and it can actually provide you with personalized content recommendations or even new content based on these preferences. I'm not sure I like that part, but I mean, and this new content would be content that it generates but by the way not what it gets from from somebody else so it just keep he just keep that in mind so it would like make its own movie for you songs for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay customized retail experiences i i would think but i think there might be at least one or two asterisks missing here uh and here, of course, you can uh, you can identify the patterns and preferences based on where the customer is spending the most amount of time while, while, while they are in your store. And then you can ha have personalized marketing strategies, store layouts, custom discounts, and product recommendations. And virtual prototype this is actually being done by siemens where they are monitoring the performance and wear and tear of in industrial machines and then it creates a virtual prototype of an improved machine based on the data which it has obtained and also saying that maybe if you use a different kind of, of, of material and design it would pre prevent that kind of error. Production planning, this is actually being used by, 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 by BMW. They actually have sensors on the production line that monitor the equipment status and the levels of the material and the environmental conditions. And then they create optimized plans, adjusting the schedule, and then plan to account for machine downtimes and changes in the material availability. Quality control, this is actually being used by a lot of companies. These three are the big boys. Who are actually using it and then tech cameras and certain sensors on the production line we all know about that already but gen ai it can learn to identify the defects and the, and can be, and automatically adjust the, 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 the parameters and it will give you an enhanced qc process at the end of it. virtual reality this is being actually used by volvo and bosch and siemens the sensors track and analyze the movement of, of, of individuals and the real world environments. 
and then it can actually generate realistic scenarios and and kind of provide a kind of uh, made up made up challenges for the workers to practice in a safe VR VR training and environment. Personalized to training programs, which is kind of related to the first one, but here you actually have wearable de 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 devices that provide monitoring of the workers as they're going through the tra 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 training, and they, it gets a good idea of the learning pace and the information on how well they are doing, and based on that, it can come up with a personalized training program which adjusts the content and the difficulty in real time. So it's difficult. There's a company here doing that with Minecraft, um, generating training and virtual simulations. Yeah, and this is a pretty useful one, and I was quite surprised to Clear. see how many different firms were active in this. Uh, we all know you can have I I IoT devices installed in these factory floors, so in case of any kind of a spill or a fire, they they we can gather information. But the cool part here is they can use this data. A Gen AI model can use this data to create realistic simulation scenarios for emergency response training. And it helps the, the first responders to practice their, their, their responses to different types of incidences in a safe and controlled environment. There are actually a number of firms that are actually working on this. So FLIR makes the infrared camera, that company, right? Uh, the, 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 and I'm not sure, but from what I've read, Fleur actually is an expert at creating simulated industrial fires. Okay. So, and they they will give they they they, 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 they will go into great detail on how a fire can start and what, what you need to do in case of. I think it is. I've seen like most of what. Yeah. They're doing. So that's that's pretty interesting because FLIR's like the big manufacturer of infrared cameras, yeah, yeah, and yeah, they're doing yeah, fire detection yeah. with infrared cameras specifically. So I hadn't heard about this yet, where they're doing a simulation of well, that. They can. I mean, yeah. 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 Well, once again, I mean, they might be then, like I mentioned, for the ones that I knew that they were in the plans, I I put an asterisk, but. There might be a few <laughs> aspects there that that's, should have been there. Well, no, that's just yeah. very interesting. I hadn't heard that one yet. To the point that the, that someone made earlier, this is an old saying which still holds. Uh, Arbejan and uh, Arbejau still holds for large language models. So be careful on what you train your large language models with. And yeah. And it's an artifact of the data that it was trained on. And so, for well, bottom line is they are very powerful tools. Just be be careful on how you use them. <laughs> Chat GPT is not sentient. It doesn't have a conscience, nor is it capable of self-reflection of or any kind of introspection. It can't feel empathy or pain or ha ha happiness. It doesn't even know you from from Adam or Eve. And if you if you and that, that's the reason why I spend so 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 much of time on that slide about how the how the how the transformer models work. It is just a probabilistic parrot. It is picking the next word in the sequence that it believes is the most probable based on the training data that it was fed. As simple as that. Now, that brings up a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we used to do in terms of, say, uh, an airplane flight or a missile flight is yeah. that we could take random draws from a database that said, OK, this gyro will function at this level, and this accelerometer will function at this level. Is it possible, or is it uh, practical to even take a pump to pull public distributions and say, OK, instead of using this language model, uh, what would English versus what would the next word be in French? What would the next word be in German? Uh, is it possible to tweak those outputs based upon your 
your pre-selection of, of a probability distribution? You can. It comes down to how you train the model and how you post-train the model. And I mean, you can, for, for example, if you spend any time at all on this website, huggingface.co, okay. you will see they have an incredible selection of large language modeling, which you can choose, which you can filter out by your use case. Oh, okay. So you can say, I want to do, I want to do a, a, a text generation, and you, and it will. Give you, give you only those models which are best for that. Or I want to do music generation and maybe change the list, the list of models. You can filter it by size, by, 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 by use case, by how much GPU power you have, which you want to use to, to fine tune it. It's an incredible site. I mean, can you re reiterate what you said the other night about? English versus the other languages, as far as how English is mo more most difficult language. Right. I mean, it, uh, I think that could, the the question was: Are there large language models in other la la languages? And yeah. there are. Uh, I have I have I've seen papers on some of the Indian languages, but I think there are large language models in other languages. Plus. These large language models, like Chat GPT four, has got a pretty good language translation. That is, Chat GPT three point five is really bad at language translation. So, if you want to do any kind of language translation task, I would recommend not even looking at any model prior to Chat GPT four. Hmm. So, but 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 yeah, but in terms of the. Language complexity, English is one of the more difficult languages because it has been so accepting of words from other languages. So you have, I mean, it has taken in words from Hindi, it has taken in words from French and German and, and, and Latin, whereas all the other languages are, haven't been so accepting, which makes them more regular and makes them more easier for a machine to learn. So that's the. So functionality versus responsibility. Entrepreneurs and engineers in general are all about getting things done, right? Boom, boom, boom. And chat GPT and BAR and other large language models are a fantastic source of time. If you want to write business letters, flyers, marketing collateral, generate code on the fly. I mean, chat GPT and all the other large language models are great for what I call for, for boilerplate code. If you want to write code to de decrypt a key, or if you want to write code to do some server-based stuff like a REST API, which has been done millions of times before, and you want to spend time looking at the syntax, you can ask ChatGPT to give you that code in Node.js or PHP or Python, and it will do it. Just make sure to check it first. Small, focused right. questions. I mean, simple tasks, right? It's fantastic, right? But in the rush to get things done, it's quite easy to forget a few things. Be wary of introducing biases in your generative AI content. Establish an AI governance policy in your firm. It's your, you are never too small to have one. It is the mindset that matters. So as you grow, your AI governance policy grows and changes. Because it's a lot easier to have an AI governance policy upfront than to go back and change it. Because going back and retraining your fine tuned large language model is going to be very expensive. And trying to handle the blowback from your business partners and your customers could be even more expensive. In, in, in a mid sized organization, you've got the president couple of VPs running around, you have a CFO, C COO, that sort of thing. Within which department would you say would be the most logical place to put the AI governance activity? I would say it would be the COO and the, and the CSO, but the buck would always stop with the CEO. It has to come from him or her saying that you, we are going to have an AI governance policy and that's it. Do what it takes. So I'm, I'm having this discussion with the company and, uh, and UTD as well. 
So there's not a lot of good policies out there to look at in, in terms of frameworks at the moment. So it seems to me that everybody is leaning much towards the policy of banning it outright, yeah, yeah. which I think is, is a little too much right. because it is very difficult to come up with a governance policy. This is, that is not an easy thing no, to, is, to come I mean, up with. You, you, you have to factor in what is it you're trying to do as an organization. But do you know of any good examples or something out there that's, that's, that's kind of already created some frameworks today? Because this is a very relevant question that a lot of companies are asking right now, and there's not a lot of guidance. Interestingly enough, I would start with posing that question to Chad. Yeah, Jimmy. Yeah. I think Seriously. you do a live exercise. Right? Yeah, yeah. that would be interesting. And, but but give, the, give as much detail as you want in your prompt. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I was only half, yeah. half joking, but if you gave it the proper prompt, you would be amazed at yeah. how detailed it comes back. Still, there's a decision that have right. to be made. But I mean, each company has to make that choice and the decision on their own based on what they want. I mean, you, you can wing it, but at some point it's gonna come and really hurt, hurt you. I have just not seen anybody publish best practices on this yet. And that's, that's kind of my question. Have yeah. you seen any, anybody really I, make I these statements? I've a few large companies make a big deal about it, but of course they haven't. They haven't published what, 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 yeah. what they're talking terms. I think it has to come down from the government first. They are waiting for government regulation. Oh, they'll be waiting. Which is usually a bad thing to do. It's a long way. That's, that's terrible. Yeah. You have so many unintended consequences whenever the government gets their yeah. big fat fingers in it. And it's yeah. a long way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> challenges, like to say, you put a compliance in place with the right. government. Well, not, how do you differentiate from one business to another, right? Well, exactly. this is ethical, I might deem it's not ethical and use it vice versa, right? Now, if Absolutely. GDPR is not complied by the government, like, would you comply with So as an organization, I feel like this, you need the bigger authority to pull these things down. Yes. Yep. Okay. An IP lawyer's dream? Probably. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how, how, how many of you heard of the lawsuit that the NYT is contemplating. They want to dock open AI like $15,000 per infraction. And we are talking per infraction of per news article because they don't they don't like OpenAI scraping the New York Times websites. I think it's either fifteen thousand or it might be one hundred fifty thousand. I might be missing a zero there, but it's per per, per infraction. Now, we are talking real money here. So uh, Mid Journey, yeah, Dali and Dali Two and Stable Diffusion. All of these are text to image generation more models. They are very popular people. That's how you get uh, famous people doing all kinds of weird things because people that type that in and it puts out the photograph or an, in, 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 uh, or, or, or an image of that particular person who could never do that in real life. But there you have it. Uh, IP and true ownership of AI generated co content is rapidly becoming a Tawny issue. It was always an issue, but now people are beginning to wake up to it. And this is where blockchain is going to really help because it will help you record the provenance and the o o o ownership of the data that is used to train a generative AI model. Because right now, you do not know when you see a picture or a piece of text where all it came from. And a lot of people are very rightfully angry about that. You used my painting, and this was supposed to be created by a by a model, presumably. But that model was trained on 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 my painting, and so this is. There's also even a more specific example. I know several voice actors, yeah, um, personally, and their voices were completely Absolutely. used. Yes, yes. Um, and you can actually type in and have them say right. in their voice whatever you want right exactly and here and but now you you, you can have decentralized ai ai training platforms where you where you can set up smart contracts that automatically reward the people who gave the data who co contributed the data how cool is that i i i got four tokens 
because they used my speech or something. <laughs> or you could have a decentralized AI, uh, a, a, the, the decentralized marketplace for a, a, AI more, more, more models. As long as my model passes the authenticity test and does what I claim it does, and that that, that is that it can be independently verified, I get paid once again via smart contracts. I mean, I, I can talk. I, I I can have an entire talk on blah, 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 on on blockchain and Gen AI. The, 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 the possibilities are quite incredible and and large there. And I think we are going to see. And people are just waking up to the how blockchain can be used. And and uh, unfortunately, in the general gen, gen, discourse, the, the Bitcoin and crypto. Cryptocurrency have kind of completely. The guardrails are, are coming. We're watermarking the regulatory requirements, the best practices. Bottom line, generative AI does not give you the right to plagiarize or use somebody else's IP. Once again, it, go, it goes back to this uh, AI governance form. Human creativity is still our biggest asset and should be at the center of everything we do. The chat GPT, Bard, Claude are fantastic. They make you, they help you, they may make you get things faster. That should, that should, that should never replace your creativity, your ingenuity, and your humanity. Over reliance on chat GPT and its brother, in my opinion, is a recipe for robotic mediocrity. Yeah. Uh, uh, after a while, you can tell a piece of text was from chat GPT. It has got that there is a certain tone to it. Mm -hmm. At really the end of the day, all these are tools. Treat them as such. That's <clears throat> Absolutely.